So if you have your Bibles with you, if you want to, turn to Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to pick up uh, where we left off when the summer hit. Um, we, we went into a summer series. Man, it's good to see all of y'all. We went into a summer series and we went through the seven churches of Revelation. And so we did that knowing that people would be on vacation and going and coming and all that. And, and well, now that school has started back, and aren't y'all glad school has started back? Okay. That's all the parents saying that, not none of the kids. But um, now that school started back, we figure that you're going to be here for a while because, uh, you know, as we go through a book, as we go through chapter by chapter and verse by verse, you know, there's things build upon uh, each other and you you get a more complete picture of what God is trying to to say as you go through the letters that he gave to Paul and to Peter and to John and and the uh, the gospel message and of course uh, the Old Testament uh, you go through and you see his nature and his character and so we're going to get back to uh, Hebrews and we're going to finish it at least by my uh, estimation sometime in the middle of February so we're going to be in the book of Hebrews for a long time and uh, we're going to look at it really closely uh, today today the the title of the sermon is for the sins of many uh, and uh, I want it to be a reminder or a refresher for those of us that have given our life to Christ and an announcement for those that don't know Him, that Christ gave His life to take away the sins of the whole world. Uh, probably one of the, the first verses you ever learned in memory uh, verses is John three sixteen: for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And so as we go through this, I want you to see this in that lens that Christ died for each and every one of us to take away the sins of the world. And that that gift of grace is offered to all who will accept it. All that will believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. Then, then what he did for us on the cross, the, the death that, that he suffered, the blood that he shed, is for us. And you go, yeah, but pastor, I'm already saved. I've already done that. I've walked the aisle. I've been in the baptismal waters. But listen, if we don't remind ourselves of this from time to time, actually, if we don't remind ourselves of this often, then coming to church can just be, eh, it's just something to do. It's not a celebration of what Christ has done for us or an opportunity to come in here and worship Him with all our heart and to, to give Him every part of ourselves. It's not... Uh, you know, if we, if we begin to take it for granted, then we're going to come in here and it's just going to be something to do on a Sunday. And, and even then, there's going to be this time where you go, well, you know, I'm kind of tired. I think I'll sleep in. And, and I will tell you, for all of us that are still working, there's not a one of us that on a Tuesday, when you have to get up and go to work, would go, well, you know, I'm kind of tired. I think I'll just sleep in. Okay. Any of y'all do that? I mean, if you have sick days, you might call in, even if you're not sick. But, but there's even ethical problems with that. But that's beside the point. The fact that we're saved, the fact that Christ died for you and I, it has to mean something. We're going to look at, and, and just in brief, look at the, the sacrificial system of the Old Testament and what it taught these believers and we're going to look at the, the tabernacle and, and what it meant uh, as we go through and we kind of recap and reintroduce Hebrews to everybody. And, and, and we have to understand that when we talk about the sacrificial system and we go, yes, but Christ, he took care of all that, right? When he went up on the cross and he died, he satisfied the requirements of the law that a death must occur and blood must be shed for the remission of sins. And what we forget to think about is what went on before all of the sacrifice that went on before in the Old Testament time frame for the nation of Israel to teach them about their need for a Savior. And, and I just want you to think about this. We're going to revisit it a little bit as we get into the message. But I want you to understand something. Think about day after day, the, the Israelites were to bring a sacrifice for sin. When, when, they, when they committed a sin, they were to bring a bull or a goat or some sort of sacrifice for sin. Now, a little bit, we'll get into some more of the specifics in the message. But each individual family was to give that, asking the Lord, begging for His mercy. 
that he would forgive them for the sins that they have committed. Not cleansing their conscience, but, but forgiving them for the sins that they committed unintentionally because he had commanded them to follow the law. And you have to think about what that scene must have been like in the tabernacle and then eventually in the temple where the, where the golden altar was there and that was where they made the sacrifices and the priests and the Levites working day and uh, throughout the day and, and uh, uh, making sure that the sacrifices were appropriate and that they were placed on the altar and that they were taken care of. And, and the hundreds of thousands of animals. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to say I'm an animal rights activist. I'm just trying to paint a picture for you. That if you have a hundred families lined up to, to offer a sacrifice for the sins of their family or for the sins of the individual, then you had a hundred animals that were going to be sacrificed on that day. Anybody ever been to a slaughterhouse? Do you understand? I mean, it's not like what... And Cecil B. DeMille did a great job with the greatest story ever told. But it's not like you know, the, the movies of old that it's just a nice, clean area. Oddly enough, Bethlehem housed the sheeps that were the, the, the lambs, the one-year-old unblemished lambs that were for the sacrifice, and they were kept in a very nice, clean area. But, but you, you're going to see that, I mean, this was an ugly business. Not the sacrifice itself, but because sin is so ugly. Sin that separates us from God. And so as we get into Hebrews again and we look at it, um, I just want you to, to, to keep in mind that we are in danger of living a sanitized life, not recognizing the ugliness of our own sin. And that's why I say that we need to not take it for granted when we come into this place. A man, Jesus, came and died in your place. So that we could have eternal life. And when we come into this place, it is not to go through the motions, but it's to worship with all our heart, in gratitude, and in awe of a God that before the world ever was, planned for his son to come and die. And for the man Jesus, his son, to follow the plan of the Father and to come and to give his life for you and I that were not worth it. Seldom will one man give his life for another, yet for a good man some would even dare to die. Still, while we were sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, you and I. And, and I'm not trying to start a, this note on a downer. I'm not trying to start the message on a downer. I'm trying to start it on a serious note that we get to be here because he loved us so much. Now, as we go through, I, just a few things about, um, about this book. As we, as we go through uh, the, the book of uh, Hebrews, I want to remind you about the author. We're not quite sure who the author was. Many people think it was Paul. Some people think Barnabas or Apollos. I mean, some even think Priscilla wrote it. I personally think that Luke wrote it uh, just because of uh, uh, some of the language that's used in there. But it was written to Jewish Christians, Messianic Jews uh, or Hebrew Christians. Some think that it might have been uh, second generation Hebrew Christians, but but I tend to think that it was because of all the priestly language that it might have been written to a group of priests that had left the temple and given their life to Jesus and were following him now. But the, but the difficulty was for them was that now they were being persecuted. Now they were being uh, put upon. Now they were uh, having to deal with the difficulties of a world that was hostile towards them. And they were thinking about maybe possibly might go back to what they were used to which was the old Judaism, the, the, the sacrificial system, the thing that they were comfortable with, the things that, that by that time maybe they had gotten to the point where they were just going through the motions. Okay, do you see the connection there? And, and, the, and the danger is, as Christians, 
that we can want to go back to an old way, a way that's easier, a way that's more comfortable, a way that, that, that we're comfortable with, that, that is secure to us, and, and we, we get into this mode of, well, it, let's just go through the motions. And they were wanting to do that. One, they didn't want to be persecuted anymore. And, and two, it was something they were familiar with. And so the author, whoever he is, we know that it's the Holy Spirit ultimately, but the author, whoever he is, the earthly author, uh, wrote this letter to try to encourage them and to convince them that Christ is the only way, that he is the superior person, that he is superior over Judaism, that he is actually the fulfillment of Judaism. He is what the whole Hebrew system was, was pointing towards, showing us our need. Paul writes that the law was, was given to us to be a tutor to us so that we would understand our need for a Savior, that not one of us can do anything to initiate our own salvation. And so he's writing to them again to show, listen, you, you lived your whole life following the law. You lived your whole life under this old sacrificial system, and it's not good enough. And he starts out in chapter 1, and I'm not going to go through every chapter, I promise. But he starts out in chapter 1, he says, In the past we talked to you through the prophets, to the fathers of old, but now today we've talked to you through my son. Today he's the revelation. And then he goes on and he builds this case that Jesus is the perfect high priest. And that the word of God is sufficient and in the first part of chapter 9, he shows that Jesus was the one that was able to come into the presence of the king because of the blood that he shed. And that because of that blood, we are able to come into the presence of God. And with that, we pick up with verse... Well, actually, we're going to go back to verse 13, but we, we pick up, we're going to be looking at verses 15 through 28. But we're going to look at Jesus as the mediator and the testator of a new covenant. Now, testator is a word you hadn't heard very often, right? And I'll just give you a little preview. I mean, when you write a last will and testament, if you, if you have a will in your, in your uh, uh, documents at home, your estate documents, that is a last will and testament. Well, someone had to give that will. They had to be the testator. They're the ones that, that write the will. And, and he talks about that in the, in the passage today. But Jesus is not only the mediator of a new covenant, but he is the testator of that covenant. But none of it happens without the blood of Christ. Look at verses 13 and 14, and if you, if you can, is read through. They're going to be up on the screen. He says, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh... How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? What He's talking about and what these people understood was this. He said, listen, if, if, if those old sacrifices serve to purify the individual, how much more will the blood of Christ satisfied to purify you and your conscience. See, sin demands a death. For the wages of sin is death. And all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And we think, man, that's kind of harsh. And, and yet, it, it really isn't because God is the standard bearer. He's the standard giver. And, and unless you think Him harsh, He's also giving you a way to be forgiven, and we'll get into that in just a little bit, but sin demands a death. It demands blood be shed. That's what he was trying to teach them in the old system. And so he says, if that blood was good enough to purify the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ satisfy to purify the very conscience, the soul? See, sacrifice requires a spirit of repentance. It does no good if you were in the Old Testament days and you, you were in that line, you're waiting to go and offer your, your bull or your goat for, for a, a sacrifice for a sin. By the way, that cost you something because that came out of your flock. 
Today it would be, let's go give money or whatever. But I mean, you're not going to the local grocery store and buying a leg of lamb and it's satisfied. Okay, you're, you're bringing a live animal that was from you that you either had to purchase or it was in your flock. So you were sacrificing that. You were giving it up, asking for God's mercy to forgive you for the sins that you committed since the last time you came to the altar and offered a sin sacrifice. And so it requires a spirit of repentance, this sacrifice. I mean, if, if you weren't really asking God for His mercy in the Old Testament time and you put a, a, a sacrifice up on the altar, did it really work? Or were you just going through the motions? And in today's world, if you walk down the aisle or if you pray a prayer or, or you say that you're a Christian because you belong to a certain church, and yet there's not an evidence of a changed life. There's no repentance evident in your life. There's nothing that shows that you're walking with Christ and that you love Him. Is it really real? It, it, we have to think about these things. And, and I've told you before that, that in my life, if you looked at me as a high school student, at least maybe I'm maybe... A, being hard on myself, but there's probably not any way you would have gone, well, he's really a Christian. He talks the talk, but he's not living the life. And, and probably all of us have been in that circumstance or situation, but, but God didn't let me go. He reminded me of who I was, and he reminded me of his love for me, and he brought me back to obedience in my early 20s, and I'm grateful for it. But in the old system, the worshiper was, was pleading for the mercy of God. They had the Old Testament that said that if you sin, that that was worthy of death. That the penalty for sin was death. And they knew that. And so what they were doing when they brought that sacrifice was they're going, God, please show me mercy. Don't give me what I deserve. And yet God in the New Testament gives them what they didn't deserve. The grace of Christ. But the blood of Christ is what did that. And for the Old Testament, there was even this, this promise of a sin bearer to come. If you, look at, if you look at Isaiah 53, a chapter that today is not typically read in the synagogue, but it's the, the suffering servant. Who's believed our message? Verse 1. To whom has the Lord revealed the, His powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender shoot, like a root in the dry ground. And there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. Yet he was despised and rejected. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And though we thought his troubles were a punishment from God a punishment for his own sins. He was pierced for our rebellion and crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. This is the significance of the death of Christ and the blood of Christ that he died for you and I. And in verse 15, he says, therefore. And that's why I had to go through verses 13 and 14, because of the therefore. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant. So that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. You see, a mediator brings two parties together. And sin had separated us from God. In the, in the Garden of Eden, when Adam broke his commandment, he was separated from God. And God knew that was going to happen, and so he had to send his son. And you know all of this, and yet I'm still reminding you because we need to see the magnificence of it. That even though we were separated from him, he still wanted to be with us. It kind of makes the point, you didn't find God, He found you. 
He pursued you. And in that moment when he offers his gift of grace, you have nothing to do but to accept it. You aren't searching for him. There was a movement in the 80s, I think, called the seeker-sensitive movement, where people were coming and trying to find something. And they said, well, that's all about the person. They were, they're, they're trying to seek God. Well, no, God is drawing them. Shouldn't have been seeker-sensitive. I'm not sure what, the, what, what you'd call it, but it was God drawing them to church to hear about the message of salvation that he had. But here we, we see the mediator. And you see in the second part of verse 15 that it was his death, his blood that became the medium of that arbitration. So how could Christ mediate our coming back into the presence of his father? He could stand there in front of his father seated at the right hand of the majesty, and he could say, listen, my blood cleansed him. That's the mediation. My blood has made him whole. He's accepted the gift of grace that I've offered him. And this sacrifice, unlike the Old Testament sacrifice, which was only retroactive, only covered the sins that they had committed, this sacrifice covered the sins that you've committed the sins of today, and the sins that you will commit. The sins past, present, and future. The blood of Christ, the mediator who mediates the new covenant, the new contract, he, because of the blood that he shed, says they are mine when they give their life to me. And so in verse 15, you see him very clearly as the mediator of the new covenant. In verse 16 and 17, you see him as the testator, the one who wrote the will. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. So if a will is out there, today what happens when somebody passes? You have to write off, you have to get someone to sign off that uh, they are truly dead, typically a doctor or some sort of medical professional. You send off to the state. They send you a death certificate. And then you have to send that to, to Joe and Bob and Sally and every business and every person that ever did business with that person so that they can attest that, yes, they are truly dead. And any assets are now frozen until the will takes effect. And so he says, for where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. Well, we saw it established on the cross, Right? We saw him die on the cross. There is, there's eyewitnesses to that. And, and the world today will tell you that he really didn't die, but, but he did. And the document, the Bible that we hold so dear, is completely sufficient. It is inspired by God. It shows what happened. And he goes on in verse 17, he says, For a will takes effect only at death since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. So Christ had to die for that will to take effect. And here's an interesting fact. In verse 15, the word covenant, and in verse 16 and 17, the word will are the exact same Greek word, diatheke. And the covenant that he talks about, the mediator of a new covenant, is, is couched in religious terms. It's the agreement that God made through His Son, Jesus, that He would die on the cross and and pay for the penalty of our sins. But when He gets to the point of a will, it becomes legal. And God says, I will abide by the terms of the agreement that I made. My Son died for your sins. When you give your life to Him, then I will accept you back into my presence. When you give your life to Him and accept the grace that He offers you, then you're back to me. You're mine. I think it's interesting that the Holy Spirit uses this and they they, they use the same term, but they would have understood it in Greek as, okay, this is the covenant between God and man through His Son Jesus. And now He's telling us that because of the death of Jesus, it is now in force. It has the force of legal backing. And and essentially, God, as the lawgiver, is saying, I made the the will through my son Jesus. He's the testator. Now that he's dead, 
The will is in force. Grace is now in play. What a, what a great thing. Jesus is not only the mediator, he's the testator, and he is the one that brings about the new covenant. He goes on in verse 18, and he begins to talk about the old covenant, and he, and he talks about how it was activated. The old covenant between uh, God and, and his people that he made to Abraham and, and he made through the nation of Israel, it had to be activated some way. And so as you look at verses 18 through 20, you see that the law that was given to Moses was initiated with blood. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet, wool and hyssop, and he sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. You can go back to Exodus 24 and you can see the whole story. You can see the whole outline of what happened. In fact, God has given Moses the law. He's come down. He's read it to the people. The people have sat there and they said, listen, we will do everything that the law says. We will follow God. We will be obedient. We know that that's not true, but they said that they would do it. I promise I'm going to follow you. But he says that it was inaugurated in blood. When, when they said that they would follow this, then they sacrificed the blood of bulls. They took the blood. He mixed half of it, uh, a little bit with water. He took some hyssop. He took some scarlet wool. He began to sprinkle it on the, the book. And by the way, anybody ever been to SeaWorld? Been in the splash zone? If you were close to the pulpit, then he's got this blood and he's splashing it over you to initiate that covenant. A death took place with the sacrifice of an animal. The blood was taken and it was splashed over the people that were there. And then it was splashed over the book. He took that hyssop and he just started... See, we don't think about that. I mean, you're there in your nicest clothes and all of a sudden you got blood all over it. Not even your own. Unless you think the blood had any significance, its significance was its symbology. Its significance was that through the death of that sacrifice, that covenant was inaugurated. The covenant with Moses. And you go on and you look down and you look at the tabernacle. It too was also initiated in blood. Look at verse 21. And in the same way he sprinkled with blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. You remember you go back to Exodus and you see the detailed instructions that God gave in making the tabernacle. Um, how there was to be an inner chamber and an outer court and there was going to be uh, the vessels within there. I mean, he was very detailed with how he was going to do it. You had to have certain thread. You had to uh, make panels that were uh, um, had these particular uh, pictures on them. You had rings of gold. You had all of these things, certain woods for the tent poles, everything. He brought in craftsmen to, to make the, the utensils that were used in worship and the, the table for the showbread. And, of course, the Ark of the Covenant was was made during that time and you had to have certain garments to, to uh, move it and you had to have certain uh, poles uh, layered in gold to, to carry it and you had all of these different things. They made the lampstand and the, the um, uh, altar for incense and, and they set it all up and you know it's kind of like buying a new house. Have you ever built a house from scratch and you go in and everything is perfect? There's not a scratch on the wall. There's nothing there. It's all pristine, the floors are clean, the windows are clean, everything looks great, you buy the furniture, you move it in, you don't scuff up one wall moving in the bed, into the bedroom. How many of y'all have done that? You get everything in place, and then what Moses did was he came through with the rest of that blood and he started splattering it all over. Why? To purify it. To signify that it was now under the covenant, that it was part of the the, the the worship center for the covenant. It was nothing magical about the blood. It was a symbol 
that that covenant was in place and this would be the place of worship. This would be where they would come and offer the sacrifices for sin because in Deuteronomy, throughout all of that book, as he's given that law again, he kept saying, but when you fall away, but when you become disobedient, but when you do this, these are the things that are going to happen. And so he put the old sacrificial system in place to teach them of their need for a better system. And so you saw the old covenant activated through the blood of Christ. And in verse 22, he tells you why it's necessary. He said, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Verses 1 through 14 of chapter 9 were all about the new tabernacle, the one that's in heaven. That the old was not, it was just a shadow of what the new was going to be. But he writes, he says, listen to the audience, you understand this. It was necessary for the blood to be sprinkled on these things to purify it. Now think about this. You get a brand new set of clothes and somebody comes and sprinkles clothes or blood on it and they go, hey, you're now purified. You go, I got stains all over my, my, my new robe. Again, it was not the blood, it was the... It was the symbol of that. That it was set apart for God's purposes. That the children of Israel were set apart as His people. That the worship within the tabernacle was set apart for them to come and give themselves to Him. That the book of the law was set apart as something that they would follow and show their love for Him. And yet it said those were just shadows of what was in heaven. And they needed a better sacrifice than these. See, the blood emphasizes the seriousness of sin. It is no less serious today to commit a sin than it was back then. We just haven't seen all of the blood. We haven't seen all of the sacrifices. We haven't seen all of the things that went on in the old covenant in order for people to ask for forgiveness of their sins. What we've seen is come into a beautiful church, wear nice clothes. I'm not going around splattering blood on all the rest of you. And, and, and you come into this place and you hear the message and hopefully God quickens your heart and He draws you to Himself and you say at some point, yes, I need you. And you are broken before Him. And you give all of yourself to Him. All of yourself. The gift of grace is free, but it costs you your very life. You call Him now Lord and King. And in that moment that you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus is Lord... The Bible tells you that you're washed in His blood. You're purified. You're set apart. You're made new. I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting. He talks about a better purification and the new covenant being activated in verse 23. He says, Thus it was necessary... For the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Christ's blood is better than the blood of bull and goats. And you know what the heavenly things are? Us. We're what has been purified. You are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. You've been made clean, you've been made whole, you've been set apart to do His work. Sin is ugly. The penalty for that sin is death. In the Old Testament, thousands of animals. 2,000 years ago, one man. So that we could come into His presence See, it's either the life of Christ that has to pay the penalty or it's our lives that have to pay. 
And for those that reject Christ in that day of judgment, they will pay that penalty for the sin with eternal damnation and eternal separation from a holy God. And for those that have given their life to Christ, He's going to say, well done. Enter into my rest. But a better purification was needed for the new covenant. That's why Christ came. And He was the perfect representation. He was the perfect representative. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, i.e. the tabernacle on this earth, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Christ is not reigning from a, from a throne that is secondhand. He's reigning from a throne in heaven, which is as it should be, seated at the right hand of the glory in heaven. He reigns from the white, right hand of God the Father. And so He appears before the Father on our behalf. That's why we can't take sin for granted. That's why we have to have a seriousness about this salvation that He's provided us. That's why we have to recognize that it matters. See, His sacrifice was sufficient. Look at verses 25 through 28. I need my glasses again. Nor was it to offer himself. He, he's appearing in the presence of God on our behalf. In verse 25, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places year after year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Every year, the nation of Israel had to have a sacrifice for the whole of the, of, the, of the nation. Each individual had to bring sacrifices for themselves year after year to ask God to forgive them for the sins that they had committed throughout the year. And what Christ is saying right there is one time is enough. Once. He didn't have to go back in and be crucified every day. He, he died once. And it was sufficient so that you and I can live in awe of Him and in wonder of Him and in gratitude to Him and in obedience to Him. The blood of bull and goats didn't satisfy. Only Christ's sac sacrifice is sufficient and only Christ's sacrifice is effective. In verse 27 it says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for Him. Every one of us has an expiration date. Every one of us, our days are written in a book, all of them, and one day... The end of that book is going to happen. And the last page is going to be read. And God is going to call you home. And he's saying it's appointed for us to live on this earth once and to die once. And I think it's interesting that so many in this country, so many in this world who claim to be Christians, they want to go back to an old way. They want to live the way they always have lived. We, we don't recognize the sacrifice that he made for us. And maybe you're a Christian 80 years. Maybe you're a Christian 8 days. Maybe you're a Christian 8 minutes. We have to recognize what he replaced. But the cost of his life. We would remember it better if we were standing up here and people came in with guns. And Kyle, I'm going to use you. Kyle and I are standing there 
and we're, we're waiting for him to come in. And they said, we're going to shoot you. And Kyle goes, no, I'm going to stand in front of you and take that bullet. Man, I would be grateful to him for the rest of my life. There's a story of a rural village. In a rural village lived a doctor who was noted both for his professional skill and his devotion to Christ. After his death, his books were examined. Several entries were written across them in red ink, forgiven, too poor to pay. Unfortunately, his wife was of a different disposition, insisting that the debts be settled. She filed a suit before the proper court, and when the court When the case was being heard, the judge asked her, Is this your husband's handwriting in red? She replied that it was. Then said the judge, Not a court in the land can touch those whom he has forgiven. Here's the application. For those who are called and those who are being called. For the Christian. Remember his sacrifice. Don't take it for granted. Remember the price that was paid for your salvation was the life of a man who did not deserve that death and yet went to that cross for you for the sins of all. And as you're remembering the sacrifice that he made, also remember your need. Remember back to that moment of of giving your life to Christ. Maybe whatever that that time might have been. The emptiness that you felt, the the loneliness that was there, the, the hopelessness that you had. But remember your need. You realize that you could not save yourself. That nothing you could do would ever affect your getting into heaven except saying yes to the gift of grace that was offered to you. And then remember His grace. His unmerited favor. Because I wasn't worth dying on a cross for, and yet He did anyway. That's for the Christian, for the called. The people that have, given, that, that have said, Yes, Lord, you're, you're my King. Think of those words. You're my King. My life is no longer my own. I have been bought with a price. An inestimable price. And for those who are being called. There may be people online listening. There may be people in this sanctuary that have never given their life to Christ. Or Christ is tugging at your heart right now. And you know that you need to make a decision. You need to recognize His sacrifice. It's hard to transport yourself back 2,000 years ago to see the excruciating death on the cross. But what you need to remember is that a man died for you. You can't do it on your own. You need to recognize your need. You need to recognize that without somebody to save you, without somebody to forgive you, to take your penalty, you're going to be eternally separated when that last day comes. And for those of you that are being called, you just need to simply receive the grace that's being offered. You see, if you're here and you're lost and you, you, you feel that tug... It's not you that brought you here. It was God that brought you here because He wanted you to find Him. He is offering you today that gift of grace. In a moment, we're going to have an invitation. And I'm going to be a little bit clearer on the, on the instructions. We're going to lower the lights. And music is going to be playing quietly. And in your seats, when I give you the instructions, I want you to pray and and to ask God what it is He wants you to do. And if you need to come down front, there's going to be a group down here praying. There's going to be altar for you to pray at. There's going to be pastors down here and deacons down here to pray with you. Don't worry if somebody's seated next to you. They'll, They'll let you by. But if you feel that tug, if you feel that that move of God, 
Don't sit in the seat and ignore it. But as, as the music's playing, I want each person to contemplate, Lord, what is it you want me to do with this message? And then as we get to the end of it, I'll look and, and our praise team will begin to sing quietly and you can continue to pray. And then I'll pray at the end of it for the end of the, the invitation. But we want you to have an opportunity to talk with God. If you're the called, if you're a Christian, have you taken this life for granted? Have you said, ah, I'm a Christian. I'm forgiven. If I mess up, God's already forgiven me for all my sins. So he'll forgive me for that one. And you've forgotten the wonder and the awe of what he's done for you. As we begin to pray, as the music begins to play and we begin to pray, just ask God to renew that sense of urgency to serve him, to renew that understanding of yielding your will to him so that he can have his way in your life. Not your will, but his will. And to renew to you the joy of your salvation. That in this world that's so dark, that you remember what he did for you and how much he loved you. And if you're here and you don't know him, and you start asking yourself, why in the world did I even come today? And you just feel this overwhelming tug that, that you need to do something about that. You have a choice. You can deny that, and you can walk out of here, and maybe the chance won't ever come again. Or you can go with that and step out in the aisle and come down and talk with one of us and let us show you what it is to give your life to Jesus. If you're here and you'd like to join with this body of believers, that too is an act of worship. And maybe you've been struggling with that, but it'd be the time to come down and tell us, hey, this is where God wants me to serve. Whatever that decision is, as the music plays, as the lights are lowered, as we just contemplate the message, ask God to speak to your heart. And don't deny what he's calling you to do.